Um, okay, so you always felt like you were on the tail end of things, but you said yourself you were there for the early days of Nick. What were the early days of Nick like? That's but so that is like an environment that was like it's beginning time the way SNL yeah. was, and um, you know it. There were a lot of smart people. I mean, that's I would say the two, the three biggest factors in that being as successful as it was, you know, um, are that um, a bunch of smart people. Uh, some of them were not that experienced, but that was probably good because that meant they were more original than mm -hmm. having worked everywhere else. And there was a really visionary executive, uh, two of them. There were, there were a number of them, but mm -hmm. the most important were, were like Jerry Laybourne and um, who invented Nickelodeon and Ann Sweeney was there who also went on to run Disney and FX and, right. and all sorts of places. And uh, so there was, there were good executives who cherished creative people and let the, and, and they wanted us to do explosive different stuff you could mm. fail, but you couldn't not do something original. Right. That was the idea. And that doesn't happen very often. And, and then the third factor is that there was a network to define that was in that bubble edge thing I talked about, which is that no one took kids TV seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, Disney was old yeller. They didn't really yeah. take it seriously. You know, they did wholesome entertainment. They That's didn't right. do kids for kids, you know? And so the fact that kids hadn't been really tackled was huge. And I think in the end, at least from me, from my perspective, and I think from everybody's perspective to a great degree, we really wanted to do something authentically, authentic kids, you know, something with a, a kid voice that was authentic, mm -hmm. you know? See, MTV was not that way. MTV was the wrong way to do it because yeah. MTV really was in the pocket of the music business as opposed to being in the pocket of the music listeners and the culture. Right. And that's where it wasn't the same as Nickelodeon. We were doing our alliance, our allegiance were to the kids. Yeah. And, you know, and that was a, not to the toy makers, not to the, you know, serial guys you know so yeah and yes. mtv was more for like teenagers it was like beavis and butthead was more for teenagers but somehow kids ended up watching it because it was a cartoon well that's because of a very interesting concept uh that's become almost like i think to some degree lethal or overboard but there's this thing called age compression hmm. and have you ever heard that expression no what's that you didn't realize you're a victim of it <laughs> My whole generation um, so probably age, was. What? My whole generation what probably was. Oh, yeah. And yeah. more, it, it continues. It increases. So age compression is why uh, for girls, uh, girls that are 12 read 17. Right. You know, uh, kids, like SNL is watched by 16-year-olds, maybe even 14-year-olds at this mm -hmm. point. You know? and, um, and children's books that were read for um, for like six and eight year olds are now for two and three year olds. Mm. And there's this thing, there are a lot of repercussions to age compression because really at the same time that you're becoming more sophisticated and reading more sophisticated stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, or seeing more sophisticated stuff, deep down inside, you're still a kid. Right. You know, you're still your real age. And so you kind of start developing layers as a result. And I think some of it is really hard on, on kids, you know? Yeah. They had to be tough, and they're not really tough. And, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think in the 90s it was like that. It was like everything was speeding up, and and you're just watching. There's not, you know, I don't know. I guess there was a big issue with the FCC in those times trying to, you know, censor a lot of stuff on television. But, like, we were just seeing professional wrestling where they're bleeding everywhere. <laughs> right. And, and it was just... You know, it was just that's what it was. And those, well, you know, and that the actual the FCC thing was actually a good thing. Yeah, because if there wasn't the FCC thing, it wouldn't have been better. It would have been more toys. Right. That were advertisements. 
I mean, the shows would have been advertisements for toys. But the I wouldn't have a career. I've always said this. I would not have a career if there wasn't, uh, um, what was her name? Peggy something. But the FCC stuff, demanding mm -hmm. there be kids uh, programming at a certain level right. of you know, stuff. That's why, then that became, oh, we need to do quality. We need to hire somebody. And otherwise, I never would have done it. Yeah. So that became, the, the, then right through there, from the birth of there was an, uh, an op opportunity to start a thing like Nickelodeon. Because yeah. what Nickelodeon started in 85 or when did it officially start? And how did you get involved wow. with it? Well, when was I? I don't know. Let's see. Clarissa was 91. Right. So I had to be there around 89. 89. It had already been, it existed for a while in other forms. There are a couple of great documentaries about this now. Oh, okay. I gotta watch called this. The Orange Years. That's terrific. And then there's a great Ren and Stimpy doc mm. uh, that's out there. And um, yeah, so yeah, that's when it was around then. Cool. You know, and and how did they even reach out to you? Did you have, did you go on like, did your agent tell you, hey, there's this new thing coming up, this opportunity, or did they know you from, what how how does how do they just find let's, you let's just get rid of this whole idea that that somebody <laughs> introduces you or find that, that there, you have an agent or, yeah yeah but there's anything like the system that you hear about because For that's me, the I, system i've grown up in it's like how it works now it's like everything's so yeah. gatekeeped you're not allowed to do anything unless somebody else is getting paid for doing it for you like yeah, I don't buy all that. Yeah, really, actually. But, I mean, I know that's yeah that happens. It goes on, but but I really think. I mean, I've always. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I always. Um, I was never represented by an agent until right. recently, and and it just never. Agents don't really. I've had lawyers that were good. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I have a great agent now, but I, but really, basically, I everything I do everything myself. I just Got find. It. I mean, I don't always negotiate the deal. I don't know, but the whole idea of oh, they're going to get your work or they're going to introduce you to somebody, I've never seen it happen right. in my entire career. So basically, and especially kids at that time, was really, um, it wasn't a business. Right. It was just, it was a side, it was a sidebar thing, you know? Um, and I guess this happens all the time when you do interviews, you get people's bings and, <laughs> and, and it doesn't even phase you, right? It's no, just I'm, nothing. I'm, yeah, nothing. It's all we're all same. used to, we're all used to going through the world with bings and <laughs> yeah. dongs and stuff. Um, Notifications. Yeah, anyway, all the so, time. yeah, the business, it, it wasn't really a business, you know? It was really, um, because there wasn't much money being made in kids right. at that time initially. I mean, it did eventually become a big business and people did move into getting agents and having um, being, you know, I guess there were people that were introduced that way, but I was always sort of at the ground level. Right. So I just knew the people and, and, you know, New York city where I was, there were two ways to make a living writing. You could write for kids or you could write for SNL or Letterman. Right. You know, and to lesser degree, magazines and Lampoon, and to some degree, Broadway, but that that was really pretty rarefied. Um, yeah. So, I did a lot of people did both. A lot of people wrote for SNL, but did kid shows. You know, mm. a lot of people wrote for S Sesame Street, and uh, for the National Lampoon. There's just a lot of there was a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, between the both, so you met people and you wrote stuff, but I also. <clears throat> always did my own stuff. And it's the thing that I, not to sound like somebody giving advice all the time, but the thing I've always said to everybody, just do not depend on right. the system working for you. Yes. You can try and you need a job and it wouldn't be great to get paid, you know, to write, you know, wouldn't it be great to get paid to play music, you know, or your songs make enough money. But the bottom line is you can't wait for that. You, you can try that and do that and have your side job and whatever you do, your day job, but keep making your own stuff. That's right. That was always my, um, which now I think is more true than ever. And to relate that back to music, that's exactly what I did 
for years. I had my job. I had, you know, uh, a manager trying yeah. to do this or trying to move everything behind doors or behind the curtain, just trying to make all these different moves. But it wasn't until this last year where I'm quarantined. I'm like, OK, well, let's do a podcast. Let's do this. And now I'm just putting stuff regularly on my own. And now right. it's attracting more people and more people are right. looking to be like, what are you doing? Before it was just like, oh, you're just, I'm just another band. But now that I'm doing a lot more different types of content and just putting out stuff and keeping the music uh, at a consistent uh, quality that I'm happy with, then, you know, now people are talking to me. No one talked to me before. Like, no, I know. And, yeah. I, and I can understand why. I mean, yeah. you were good before. It's not yeah. like you weren't good before. But, but the thing is that, like, it's why I started by saying you're really busy. You're doing a lot of stuff yeah. and you're not letting anything stop you. And, yeah. I think it's just got to be the way it is. I don't see, I mean, it, I think I was doing that way back when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people would look at my resume and say, well, let, when you grow up and decide what you want to do, let me know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, know? totally. Um, because I was so eclectic, but I think eclectic is the way to go. And I also think, see, here's the, here's the thing I was thinking while you were saying that. There was a time where the attitude was, oh, this is what I... I'm working, I'm working in the post office or I'm working yeah. as a lawyer or I'm working whatever way you're working. And I'm hoping I'm an amateur by music. I'm hoping to become a musician. Yeah. Well, that's kind of bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't have that issue. You know how good you are, right? I mean, you're good yeah. and you're making music, whether everybody's seeing it or understanding it or buying it. That's another issue. Yeah. And you've got to, you'll work that out. Right. In the meantime, yeah. you've got to, you know, eat and you got to yeah. pay the rent. Right. But right. there's not a question about whether you're creatively successful. Right. You know? Yeah. And you learn to define yourself. I'm sure you do this. You learn to define yourself within, in terms of your own criteria. Like someone once said to me, you know, do you like we were talking about, you know, because I've had a lot of failures and I've had some successes and I, I'm as I'm as interested in my failures. Honestly, I, I, I feel more tender towards my failures and I really wish they had happened. Yeah. And I always will. And they're always sort of in the process of maybe they'll happen. You never know. Right. Because I never give up on an idea ever. Right. But um, somebody said to me, well, we were looking through all the things I had done and, and he said, um, well, in your mind, was that a failure? This particular thing I tried mm -hmm. to do. I said, no, I thought it was pretty good. He said, well, that's, he said, that's what you really should be judging by. You